But now they are no longer certain that America's lead will continue in the future. When they see the missile gap widen, and once our atomic monopoly begins to cease. And they are uneasy about a military strategy that relies so heavily upon massive retaliation because they're not interested in seeing their house preserved only to see it blown up. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, the people of the world respect achievement. For most of the 20th century, they admired American science and American education, which was second to none. But now they are not at all certain about which way the future lies. The first vehicle in outer space was called Sputnik, not Vanguard. The first country to place its national emblem on the moon was the Soviet Union, not the United States. The first canine passengers to outer space who safely returned were named Strelka and Belka, not Rover or Fido or even Checkers. <laughs> they wonder why the Soviet Union has an economic growth of two to three times as much as the great productive country of the United States. And they wonder why it was last year that the United States had the lowest percentage of economic growth increase of any major industrialized society in the world. They wonder why Russia is turning out twice as many scientists and engineers as we are. And they are entitled to an answer. Third, the peoples of the world respect sincerity. The reason the good neighbor policy was so successful was because the people of Latin America knew that here in the United States, the policy of Franklin Roosevelt was marked by compassion and interest. The colored people of Africa and Asia believed in Harry Truman's point four because they knew that he practiced in his administration those policies without regard to race or creed for all Americans. But now they are doubtful about a party which has shown no real concern in the executive branch for civil rights, no real compassion for the underprivileged, and they do not feel that any country in any administration which does not concern itself about the problems at home will be concerned about the problems of Africa and Asia and Latin America. Fourth, the people of the world want peace. And they sincerely wonder how much the United States wants peace. They are afraid of diplomatic policies that teeter on the brink. They are dismayed that there are only 100 Americans working in the entire federal government on the vital subject of disarmament. And they are discouraged by a philosophy that puts its faith in swapping insults with the Soviet Union for they know it can lead in only one direction, and that would be towards mankind's final war. Fifth and finally, the people of the world respect a nation which can see beyond its own image. To us, the major issue is the fight against communism, but to them, those who live to the south of us, the fight is against poverty and disease and illiteracy and ignorance. Each time they feel that we seek to gain their friendship in order to secure a new recruit in the battle against communism, and each time we dismiss anti-American agitators as tools of the communists or condemn neutrals out of hand, our prestige will suffer and our relations with those with whom we wish to be friends will worsen. To rebuild American prestige will not be easy. It cannot be done overnight by a new administration, but I can assure you that a new administration will make the effort. <laughs> oh.
For I believe that the people of the world desire to be free, and they desire to follow the leadership of a strong and free United States. I think that we should move ahead on five fronts. We must have an administration that will rebuild our military strength until America is once again first across the board. <laughs> Secondly, we must have an administration that will revamp its goals in science and education until American science and American education are once again preeminent. Third, we must have an administration that moves rapidly to shape our image here at home until it is clear to all the world that the revolution for equal rights is still an American revolution. <laughs> Fourth, we must have an administration that moves forward on the road to peace until we demonstrate to a watching world as we sit on a most conspicuous stage that we are willing to devote the same energy to the struggle for peace as we now do on the struggle for arms. Fifth. <laughs> Fifth and finally, we must have an administration that holds out a helping hand to all those who desire to be independent, that assists them in meeting their own problems, assists them on the road to freedom as a friend, not as a paternalistic country that desires to use them in a Cold War struggle. <laughs> Once we move again on these new frontiers, in foreign and domestic affairs, we can regain the trust and confidence of men and women of goodwill around the world. We can more comfortably wear the leadership of the free world, and we can win the fight for peace, and this country will move again. Thank you. Would increased farm subsidies cause a greater surplus problem. Well, I think that the uh, most important thing to do is try to bring a balance between the supply and demand, to make a determination as to how much we can consume of a commodity here, how much we can usefully distribute around the world to those who are hungry and look to us for help, and how much we should distribute to our own people, and there are over five million of them who are dependent upon surplus food distribution. I saw over 100,000 of them in West Virginia alone. And the food distributions, I think, are shocking. They're so inadequate. But those three categories, the needs should be filled. And then we should try to place a limitation on production so that we don't have these surpluses hanging over the market which break the price. In other words, there should be sufficient acreage and unit control so that we don't have a surplus, but instead have a balance between supply and demand and a fair price in the marketplace. I, uh, let me say that uh, with all due respect, it seems to me that that question is worded uh, wrongly. Can an American who happens to be a Catholic be elected president? <laughs> May I uh, say that it really seems to me as one of the there are two basic provisions in the United States Constitution. One, the First Amendment providing separation of church and state. The second is Article VI, which provides there shall be no religious test for office. As the great struggle today is between those who believe in God and those who do not believe in God, it seems to me that we should not divide ourselves in this crucial stage, but instead treat every American according to his deserts, and that is make an individual judgment as to his competence to hold any office from serving in the service to president. Thank you.